At number 10 with a score of 9,249.4, Bernard King. We're not talking about inches or millimeters of jump height, and no, I'm not putting these guys on the moon. I'm talking about watts, and that means power. Welcome back everyone to your number one source for everything related to sports injuries and sports medicine news. In today's video, I'm gonna show you a top 10 list that I guarantee you've never seen before. The 10 most powerful jumpers in NBA history, backed by objective scientific calculations. After reviewing some very basic and easy to understand and physics and discussing how I calculated these numbers, we'll break down the list and see if you can guess who made the cut and who did it. If you enjoy learning about this unique side of sports, then be sure and go subscribe to my channel and check out my Twitter page for real-time breakdowns of injuries and injury analysis of your favorite athletes. Quick physics lesson to start, and trust me, this is gonna be easier to follow than what you were taught in high school. Anyone? Anyone? In 1687, Sir Isaac Newton published his Three Laws of Motion, the second of which leads us to a fundamental concept that we were all taught back in those high school physics classes of force equals mass times acceleration. It's a concept that helps us to predict and understand the motion of things in our universe, including professional basketball players. The second concept we need to understand is the law of the conservation of energy, specifically mechanical energy, which states that energy can neither be created or destroyed, only converted from one form to another. Take Vince Carter, for example. When he initially leaves the floor, he has kinetic energy, which is the mechanical energy that's a result of his movement through the air. This is calculated as one half times his mass times the velocity at which he leaves the ground squared. When he reaches the highest point in his jump, his velocity is zero for a brief moment of time, and all of that kinetic energy he had in the bottom is converted to potential energy that's a factor of how high he is off of the ground. We calculate this by taking his mass times the height he is off the ground and multiplying it by the acceleration due to gravity. Now, because energy has to be conserved, all the energy that Vince Carter has at the beginning of his jump is equal to the energy he has at the highest point of his jump as well. So what's really cool is we can use these equations to calculate his velocity at the point he leaves the ground if we know what his vertical jump height was. Going back to Newton's second law, acceleration is also equal to the change in velocity divided by the change in time. If we rearrange this equation, we can move the time over to the other side and we end up with force times time is equal to the mass times the change in velocity. This equates to the idea that impulse is equal to the change in momentum, which is the player's mass times their velocity. Now the tricky part with impulse is it's hard to really apply and understand the concept of just these vertical heights. Impulse is a factor of a force that's applied over a certain period of time, and it's hard to apply that to these individual vertical jumps because every player has a different amount of time that it takes for them to generate their jump and leave the ground. So what we can instead do is use some previous research to calculate the power that is estimated based on an athlete's jump height and body mass. If you read most high school textbooks, you'll hear about something called the Lewis formula. This was developed back in the mid 70s and for a number of years was the mainstay equation for estimating the peak power that an athlete could generate for a vertical jump. Now over time, researchers found that this equation actually did a really bad job of estimating the power. And in the late 90s, an additional research paper was published that ultimately came up with the equation that's preferred to be used today. So this gives us the final equation that I use here to calculate the top 10 most powerful jumpers in NBA history. But before we start counting down the list, I wanna give a quick shout out to the sponsor of today's video. Today's video is sponsored by Audible, the leading provider of audiobooks and spoken word entertainment. There's no doubt that what we're going through in the world right now is uniquely challenging and audiobooks and Audible are a great opportunity to step aside from everything else going on and give our eyes a break from all this screen time. Right now, Audible is offering their members even more to help get through these challenging times by expanding access to their Audible originals. And they even have great tools like Audible Sleep to help you get a better, relaxed, good quality night of sleep. If you're like me, starving for fresh basketball content right now, then I recommend you check out Ethan Sherwood Strauss's book, The Victory Machine talking all about the making of the Warriors' recent dynasty. Head over right now to audible.com slash brianmd or text brianmd to 500-500 to get signed up for your membership. You're gonna get one free title per month, and like I said, all these additional bonus features right now 
that Audible is really trying to offer to help us get through these challenging times. Thank you again to Audible for sponsoring the video. As a healthcare provider, it's great to see companies doing extra things like this to really try to help everybody out right now. But without further delay, let's get to our countdown. Starting off our list now at number 10 is none other than Bernard King. Using a weight of 205 pounds and a vertical of 46 inches, we find King in the number 10 spot. Now, a lot of skeptics will say that we shouldn't believe this vertical of 46 inches because of the era that he played in. And yes, the only place I could find this documented was this Bleacher Report article. But if we're gonna accept who's number nine and next up on this list, then we also have to accept this value for Bernard King even though this was the only clip I could find of him actually dunking. Next at number nine, barely edging out King, is Dr. Dunkenstein himself, Daryl Griffith. You don't get a nickname like that without having some serious jumping power, and with a vertical of 48 inches, he's tied for number one in the overall top 50 list that I actually calculated for the video. Griffith also played in an era where jump height could be questioned, but he consistently is reported to have had these insane hops and this vertical. And with a photo like this, it's pretty plausible. I mean, this is ridiculous. He's just floating so high up in the air. Coming in next at number eight is the first player that many of you will have actually seen play, Glenn Robinson III. The 2017 slam dunk champion has a vertical of 44 inches and weighs 222 pounds, allowing him to generate 50 watts more than Duncan Stein MD. Perhaps one of the biggest shocks at who's left off this top 10 list is actually the player who was the defending dunk contest champion the year that Glenn Robinson III won. That's right, I'm talking about Zach Levine, and he fell all the way down to number 28 in this calculation. Next up at number seven is a name you surely recognize and a player who was partially responsible for that famous D. Wade meme and your current reigning slam dunk contest champion, Derek Jones Jr. With a vertical of 46 inches in this insane clip from his UNLV Pro Day, Jones Jr. took home a controversial win in this year's dunk contest and clearly belongs on any list of all-time great jumpers in league history. Jones Jr. leaves the ground at an impressive nearly 11 miles per hour and is personally one of my favorites to watch on this list. He just has so much power and seems to just really fly and float off the ground. Now our next two spots are an exact tie when I did the math. It's two well-known high flyers, Dennis Smith Jr. and Michael Jordan. Both of these guys have the same vertical at 48 inches. Both weigh in at 195 pounds. Same power, same jump velocity. But I'm gonna give Jordan the W here because I mean, it's Jordan. So yeah, they're tied, but I'm gonna put him higher on my list. Also, Dennis Smith Jr. reportedly has an extra ACL, which is kind of like cheating anyways, right? Quick side note about this whole extra ACL story with Dennis Smith Jr. A normal ACL actually has two sort of distinctive bundles, the anterior medial bundle and the posterior lateral bundle. So I actually really wonder if it's just that his two bundles are a little bit more discreetly separated than everybody else but that's a whole idea for another video. Now we're getting ready for number four on the list and maybe you've been able to pick up somewhat of a trend in terms of who you can expect to see in the remaining four. By the way, like I said, I calculated actually the top 50 for this list. So if you guys want, maybe we can take a look at numbers 41 through 50 to see the exact opposite end of the spectrum. But getting back to the list now at number four, we're taking it back to the early 2000s with Jason Richardson. Richardson comes in with the second highest vertical jump of all time, and this combined with a bit heavier of a weight at 220 pounds requires him to be able to generate a peak power of over 9,500 watts. He won back-to-back -back slam dunk contests in 2002 and 2003 as just the second player after MJ to repeat his champion at that time. Also, these throwback Warriors jerseys, I absolutely love. Down to our top three, coming in third overall is none other than the king himself, LeBron James. LeBron is one of the most unique physical specimens in NBA history. James comes in at a weight of 250 pounds, six foot nine, and a vertical of 44 inches. The only two guys in NBA history that could be more just physical anomalies than James come in at number one and number two on this list. One interesting aspect of LeBron's in-game jumps is he seems to use less of an arm swing and less of what we would call a counter movement jump. More on that to come in future videos, but it's worth pointing out because it's nearly the exact opposite of number two on our list who uses an insane amount of arm swing to generate his power, Zion Williamson. Zion lands at number two on this list as the first player to cross a power output of over 10,000 watts, and nobody can argue with the insanity of Zion's physical attributes. Of course, he maxed out the test and set a record at Duke with a vertical of 45 inches and has wowed fans in his rookie season with his high-flying ability at the highest weight on our top 50 list at 285 pounds. If Zion were able to lose just 15 pounds while still maintaining the ability to generate this amount of power, 
he could potentially have a vertical of 50 inches. Could you imagine a 270 pound Zion with a 50 inch vertical? So we're finally here down to the number one spot, the most powerful jumper in NBA history. Drum roll please, is none other than Wilt Chamberlain. We've seen a lot of high flyers and dunkers over the years, but based on these calculations, none of them were more powerful of a jumper than Wilt Chamberlain. Wilt's athleticism is the stuff of legends that could perhaps only be outdone by the stories of his life off the court. With a vertical of 48 inches, weighing 275 pounds, and standing seven foot one, Wilt had to have been an absolute wonder to watch on the basketball court. Even if you want to argue that we can't believe he had a 48 inch vertical because of the time he played in or whatever, if we instead drop it from 48 down to 40 inches and do the same math, he would still come in at number three on this list. For more perspective, when we compare Wilt to the number 50 player on this list, his jump power is over 4,000 watts higher. So there you have it, everybody, a top 10 list like no other. I hope it was entertaining and educational. Now, of course, you can argue that there's probably some historical inaccuracies here with some of these jump heights, and depending on what their weight was at the time that height was recorded, and certainly these calculations have some room for error. But if you just look at this list, I mean, it's plausible. This list makes sense when you're talking about the most powerful jumpers in NBA history. So I think it's a pretty reasonable thing to go off of. Like I said, I did calculate a top 50 to make sure I was really capturing everybody in this analysis. So if you guys want, maybe we'll do a video looking at numbers 41 through 50 to get a sense of the absolute other end of the spectrum. Still a bunch of really athletic guys, but I think would still be interesting to see. That's it for the video though, everybody. Thank you as always for watching. Let me know any questions or comments below. And until next time, we'll see you later. Bye.